Greetings and welcome everyone to our worship service today. We're gathered here to bring praise and honor and worship to our God. And may God bless us in the service together. <clears throat> A few announcements as normal. Uh, so I will continue with the study of Revelation, the 17th chapter in the adult Sunday school. Everyone, of course, is uh, invited to uh, uh, join that. In addition, there'll be children's Sunday school going in the house next door. So that's today, a little, little fellowship time afterwards, after the service, and then at 11 o'clock. And then uh, a couple of announcements. You've already seen this, but uh, Ebenezer is going to hold a ladies' tea at noon on the 30th of this month, which is a Tuesday in their fellowship hall to celebrate their 105th anniversary. So uh, the ladies of the church are invited to go. I've heard nothing about RSVP, uh, but if that comes to me, I'll let you guys know. And we'll go from there. Um, missing baby bottles. Brian, have we gotten any new ones? So we're still missing five. We are negligent here or something. I assume that you've looked in your cupboards at your house. Remember Hadley in her recovery and the prayer and God's blessings on the baby? Lila? And remember folks uh, not here, Michelle G. and her recovery, Radani, remember Elaine as well. And uh, pray for the upcoming Synod meeting. That'll be in May in Minnow, South Dakota, for May 20th to the 23rd. And then Women's Bible, st women's Bible Study uh, this week here at the church, Tuesday. Same chapter as last time, because last time we didn't meet. Uh, so... Uh, same chapter. And then consistory also that evening. That'll be at John Gwynn's office. John? Yeah? All right. So at John's office the uh, Tuesday at 6.30. And bear in mind, uh, our communion service is coming up. That'll be May 5th. All right. With that, let's go before the Lord. Ask God to bless this worship service. Shall we pray? Congregation, let us rise to worship the Lord. Hear God's call to worship. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Our God greets us, grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's confess the words of our undoubted Christian faith in the Apostles' Creed. This is what all Christians believe. Let us now confess. People of God, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you have given us this faith to believe once for all delivered unto the saints coming first from our Lord's mouth and through, and through the apostles. They are the foundation. And he is the cornerstone. And we stand upon this confession as we confess to you that you are the triune God, 
one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, we come into your holy presence through the Lord Jesus, by the power of your Spirit, that we might rightly confess you, that we might praise and honor you, for you are our creator and you are a redeemer. And we ask, Father, then for the Spirit's grace to be poured upon our hearts, that Christ might dwell in our hearts by faith in this hour, that our unity and our fellowship and our worship might be well-pleasing to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing now to the Lord a song about his faithfulness, hymn 27, Great is Thy Faithfulness, a well-known one, and all the stanzas remain standing. Please be seated. We're going to read a scripture, the scriptures here from the New Testament. Paul's first epistle to the church in Thessalonica, called 1 Thessalonians, and uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Here it is calling us to live in light of the day that is coming. Uh, as Christians, our world, this world is, uh, it is not the center and the focus of our well-being, security, our standing with God. It is not the, uh, uh, the point and focus of our happiness. It is the city which is to come. It is the day of Christ. And so uh, that's what we'll focus on here. He says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, 
For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we shall live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also doing. This is God's holy word of admonition uh, to us. Let's now receive some instruction from our catechism, as well as confess it. That's page 672, Lord's Day 15. Here we receive instruction from the catechism, drawing from the creed about our Lord's suffering, his suffering under Pontius Pilate. Number 37, what do you understand, what do you understand by the word suffer? That all the time he lived on earth, but especially at the end of his life, he bore in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race in order that by his suffering as the only atoning sacrifice he might redeem our body and soul from everlasting nation and obtain for us the grace of God, righteousness, and eternal life. Why did he suffer under Pontius Pilate as judge? That he, being innocent, might be condemned by the temporal judge and thereby deliver us from the severe judgment of God to which we were exposed. Is there anything more in his having been crucified than if he had suffered some other death? Yes, for thereby I am assured that he took upon himself the curse which lay upon me because the death of the cross was a curse of God. So we see here our Lord suffered our Lord suffered under a temporal judge, but ultimately the eternal judge, God. And this gives us a sense of assurance because he died having taken on himself the curse which lay on each of us. The curse of God because the word of God says, cursed is everyone who continues not in everything that God says in his law to do. And of course, we come short of all the commands of God, thus under the curse. So the curse of God was placed upon him, he bore it. And this is the foundation of our salvation, the act of God, the act of Christ. Nothing we have done, nothing, absolutely nothing. And it all comes of the grace of God. So we should live, number 39, that's the way it says, for thereby I am assured that he took the curse. Assured is the word there, right? That's what the cross of Christ should give us as we think about our continuing sinfulness. It should give us assurance. Not how right or righteous or ethical or decent we are, but the foundation is what Christ did on the cross. And when we do, as we might, as we may, as we probably will, sin, remember the cross. The curse of that sin was laid upon him. All right, uh, let's now at this time go to uh, the Lord in congregational prayer. So let's bow, let's bow and pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you. Lord, it is with gladness that we bow. It is with hope, the hope of eternal life. And it is with assurance as well 
because of the blood of Christ. Hope because of the certainty that has been brought about by his resurrection. And we do so, Father, with joy. Whatever our circumstances here in this life, they might be. And they might be joyful or they might be adverse, depending on our situation here today. Father, joy because with our souls it is well. And with our future it is perfect. We have great hope and we rejoice in Christ Jesus our Lord today. He is the hope of the ages. He is the the bright morning star. And he shall come again. And we know this. That great day of salvation, fullness of it. The bright, bright shining splendor of your glory shall come. And Father, that is the day of Christ. And it is our day, the day of his people. It is the day we shall rise unto glory and reward and joy. And the promises you have given will be fulfilled. The old things will pass away. The new things will come. The world will be gone and gone forever, cast out away from the city of God. And we, O Lord, will enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. We place all of our hope then on the revelation that shall come in that day. Father, we pray until then, by your grace, strength, we would ask of you, indeed call upon you to grant us your Holy Spirit. Pour him out on us that we might walk in the Spirit, that we, O Lord, might be filled with the Spirit rather than with the world, that we might be sober-minded, devoted to what is good, given to hospitality, walking in the fruits of the Spirit, displaying the goodness of God to the world and especially to the world and the salvation you have given. Father, we pray then for the strength of the Spirit, the wisdom of the Spirit. We pray for His continuing work in our lives. Where we are weak, Father, we look to You that You will make us strong. Where we are proud, we look to You that You will make us humble. And Lord, where we are presumptuous and ignorant of Your ways, we are sort of clouded and drunk with the world, bring us to a right and good knowledge of how you would have us to live. To, as your word says, come out from among them and be separate, to perfect holiness in the fear of your name. Let us, Lord, fear you, we pray, and walk in your promises, but always giving praise. Bless each of us individually, Lord, we look to you. Strengthen us and help us to put up the good fight of faith, to stand fast and grow in our confession, which we have and continue to confess. Let us each be steadfast. Father, we would pray that you would bless our families gathered here today in every way. Lord, for you be, Lord, you be, be, be uh, pleased to be, uh, make them all fruitful and to increase, to raise godly children to you men and women who fear God and teach their children to fear you as well. We pray, Father, you will keep us from the world. In many ways, it can pressure us into various small and great compromises. Let us all, Lord, be those who are like Daniel, neither neglectful in the work you call us, nor in any way corrupt. Father, we pray you'll give us faithfulness then to you. Father, we pray then that the word will continue to work in us, bringing about the great salvation you have promised. We pray for the mission of the church, that the world will still come to know Christ Jesus, that many, Father, will hear the word proclaimed. Pray, Lord, you will grant faithfulness to the churches, grace for its leaders, pastors and elders and deacons to stand strong and hold to the faith with a good conscience, and uh, to if need be, daringly proclaim Christ because the world needs him. The world that despises you needs the one you provided for it for salvation. We pray then, bless the testimony of your church that it will be faithful and follow the lamb who has been slain. We pray, Father, you'll bless the missions of our own uh, denomination and classes, our own efforts to support the churches. We pray you'll be with the congregation in Ebenezer Reformed and Valle de Gracia. We thank you for them. We thank you for fruit that has been born. We pray you will continue to bear, cause more fruit to be born among them. And that fruit will stick and stay. And we will see a church blossom and grow in every way. So bless the labors of Reverend Apuche and the consistory. Bless Father Reverend Apuche in terms of his health. Strengthen him, we pray. 
Father, we pray your blessing on our brothers and sisters who are not here, asking, Father, uh, that, as the case may be, you will provide grace for them uh, as it is needed. Uh, Lord, we thank you then for the opportunity to worship you today. The freedoms we have, we pray these will continue uh, for us. We are unworthy, but nevertheless, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's turn to the Lord now in song. We'll turn now to 360 in the hymnal. We'll stand to sing all of the uh, stanzas. That's 360. Please be seated. Let's turn in the scriptures once again. This time, let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 11. Acts, chapter 11. At verse 19 down to 24, just a brief account uh, about Barnabas and uh, Luke makes a striking statement about Barnabas. Now, we're, we're doing, we're going through, we are expounding on the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and we are at goodness, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. The next is faithfulness, if you're wanting to know. So today, we're considering being good, being a good person, goodness. And Barnabas was such a person, as we'll see, at verse 19. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephan traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists. Now, that would be non-Jews, Gentiles. So they spoke, these folks did, to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the, Lord, hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came back to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he had come and seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them with, all, with, that with full purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord, for he was a good man, 
full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. This is God's holy word. May he open our minds and hearts to receive it, understand it, and apply it to our lives. As I say, we are considering the fruit of the Spirit in this time, this time, uh, this sermon, goodness. And I suspect goodness may not sound as exciting as, say, self-control. People want to learn about self-control because we all sense that we don't have as much of it as we want. Or faithfulness or patience. But goodness sounds a little, uh, I don't know, a little bland, maybe. Maybe that's your reaction. Maybe it's not. But what I want to show you is that goodness is actually essential. It's essential uh, to Christian character. Goodness is picked up in the Bible a lot, actually. We see here Luke describes Barnabas straightforwardly as a good man. And this is after he has described how Barnabas reacted to and responded to this uh, his going into Antioch. He was sent up there by the Jerusalem apostles and elders, sent him up there because some brothers had, and these would be Jewish brothers of the diaspora from places like Cyrene and Phoenicia and so on. Uh, Most of the brothers had been spread. And remember what happened is after Stephen was was, 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 uh, stoned to death, a, a persecution of the church in Jerusalem, this is where the church has largely been located at this point, broke out. And many of the people then scattered who were living in Jerusalem. They went to various parts. Some went to North Judea and some up north to Galilee and some went into Gentile territories. And that's what we have here. Some went up north. So north, this would be modern day uh, Lebanon, uh, Antioch. And so he went up there because they had gotten a report. There's a a lot of conversions that happened up there. We see a church beginning to emerge. Now this comes after also in the book of Acts. Peter being sent by Jesus in a vision to go and preach the gospel to Cornelius, who was a Gentile, who were unclean. It was not right. It was considered an unclean thing for a Jew to go into a Gentile's house, and he went right in because God told him to do so. He preached the gospel, and the Spirit descended, and they spoke in tongues, in languages, and preached the gospel, just like at the day of Pentecost. And Peter inferred from that that the gospel has now gone to the Gentiles, Now, it hasn't been going out very much at this point. Now we're beginning to see the beginnings of the Gentile mission, which basically will overtake the rest of the New Testament and and also the book of uh, Acts. So here we learn some Gentiles and as well as Jews, some some people have converted. He goes up and he sees the grace of God. He sees all these converted people. They're now, in some sense, they are identifying with Christ and they are walking with Christ. And it says he was glad. He sees these folks. He rejoices in the work of God and the work that these previous missionaries had done. And there was fruit. And then he begins to exhort them. He encourages them is the idea there to do one thing essentially. He probably taught a lot of things in terms of the faith and what it was. But the essence of it is you have begun in Christ. Stay. Remain. Continue in the Lord. There are going to be a lot of pressures pressuring you to veer away from him. So he exhorts them to remain steadfast. And then, seeing he, he is glad in what God is doing here. He's, he's uh, recognizing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, in this case, in conversions. And then he spends time with them to build them up in the Lord, to encourage them. And Luke makes an assessment about Barnabas at this point to describe and help us to explain why he does this. And it was because he was a good man. And he's full of the Holy Spirit. Which probably means he prophesied. He had the charismatic gifts. Those charismatic gifts did exist in the first century as part of the foundational period establishing the foundation of the churches. But part of the assessment that he gives, Luke, about the man is that he was a good man. It was from his goodness that he did these things as a man. Now, it may be the case, and it probably was a case, that he was a good man before he even came to Christ. He was brought up in a Jewish family. We're told he was a very generous individual in the early part. But now, now he has come to Christ. He's become regenerate. And whatever glimmerings of goodness that he had, because we affirm, and this is found in the canons of Dort, 
that even the natural man is not, is not completely devoid of goodness and some light of the knowledge of God. He can recognize good from evil and even strive to pursue what is good. Whatever he was before he was converted, he's much more of that now. So he's a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. And then serves, therefore, as a good example to you and me on how we ought to live. Uh, we ought to be aspirational aspire to things that are good and excellent. We ought to be aspirational people, especially as we are young, as we are beginning our lives and transitioning into adulthood. I would ask of you, and here's the, for the younger folk, what do you aspire to? And by this, I do not mean your profession. I want to be a football player in this kind of thing. When you're a little boy, that is. And then, of course, as you grow up, it, you, you get shaped in something more specific and more fitting to who you are. But I'm talking about you as a human being, you as a man and you as a woman. What do you aspire to be? Do you aspire to be a man of excellence, of moral excellence, a woman? What I'm talking about here is the kind of person. Setting all sifts, gifts Levels and abilities and intellect and competencies aside. We're actually including those by giving emphasis to your character. Moral excellence should be something you aspire to. I was listening to a guy here recently. He was talking about pornography. And he says, the reason I don't watch pornography, because it is below, it is beneath what I aspire to as a man. What do you aspire to? We should aspire to goodness. We should aspire to be good people, good men and women, ultimately because God is good. And the world needs good people. It really does. And the opposite of goodness in the Bible, through and through, is always, I wonder if you know what it is. We, we usually in our society, we say the opposite is good is what? Bad. I don't know if the word, the word bad is even in the Bible. What is the opposite of good in the Bible? Evil, wicked, right? What is goodness, brothers and sisters? Let's delve into that a little bit. What is it that the Spirit is cultivating in us? He's weaving into our character. I want to present two aspects to you of what constitutes the good or what is a good, what, what, what good means. Now, we use the word good in a variety of ways. You actually find these kind of ways in the Bible as well. As a kind of descriptor of a person, we'll say, she's a good wife. Right? Or she, he's a good doctor. Or name whatever job description they might have. A good administrator, a good teacher. He's a, a good officer. We use that. And in the main, that's talking about ability and competency right there. So that isn't quite getting us to where we want to go because it is the moral emphasis is, is found in the Scripture. But it can also reflect the moral side of it as well. In fact, it can go beyond a, a good teacher or a good officer or a good whatever the person may be can be someone who often is a person who will go beyond the demands of their particular business calling, whatever you want to call it, right? Out of the goodness of my heart, we'll say, I want, I'm giving this to you. Don't have to give it. It goes well beyond what I'm required to give. Out of the goodness of our heart. And I want to suggest to you that that's part of what goodness means. Goodness has an aspect of generosity built into it. And one good illustration of this is actually a parable that Jesus gives of the kingdom. It's found in Matthew 20. And you're familiar with this parable. It's where you have a landowner. He hires workers. At the beginning of the day, the first hour, he hires a group of workers. And these guys work through the whole heat of the day. Remember, they are day, they are day workers, so they get their wages at the end of the day. And that wage will serve, basically provide food on the table for the next day for the family and so on. So they're going to, they do, they work through the heat of the day, but near the end of the day, uh, he hires a group in the, what they call the 11th hour, he hires another group of guys, and they work for a mere hour. And you know what happens, it's time now to, uh, to, to pay the men, and he does, and he pays exactly what he said he would pay the guys who were hired, which is a, a, day, a day's wage, that's what's needed. But he also pays a day's wage to the guys who've only worked one hour. They didn't work as long, they did not work as hard, and they got the same amount of money that is a day's wage. And, of course, the first guys complain. 
They say, hey, you're making these guys, these men, and what they did equal to us, even though we worked through the whole day and through the scorching heat. And you all know and are familiar with what the landowner says in return. He says, brother or friend, I've done nothing wrong to you. Have I not given you what we agreed? The answer is yes. Then he says this, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you, be, or do you begrudge my generosity? Well, Tracy, that's the word generosity. It's not the word good. No, actually, it's the word good. It's the same word Paul uses in the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes word, excuse me, the word for generosity is, is excuse me, uh, for good. That means good. Also is translated as generosity. Bringing out the generosity aspect of what it means to be a good person. And what Jesus here is saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like. You guys who are saying that it's not fair that these guys get as much as you, you got what you deserve. You got what we agreed to. It has nothing to do with fairness. This is about my generosity. The kingdom of God is a good kingdom. It's filled with generosity. The fact is, is if, they, if he would have paid these men what they deserved, they would have got less than a quarter of a day's wage. They would have not been able to have food on the table the next day. But he's a generous man, this guy, this man. God is a generous God. He is good. He gives us far beyond what we deserve. And thankfully, he doesn't give us what we deserve. For the wages of sin is death, as Paul tells us. So that's God. That's goodness as well. It involves an element of generosity. But there's also a righteousness quality to it. The good person, as I said, is the opposite of an evil person. There's a moral quality. And this has to do with righteousness. It has to do with uprightness. And the, really a, a great here. Well, another way to put this is what we find with, with, with a person who is said to be good is there's no guile in them. There's no deception in them. They are who they are. What you see is what you get. What they say they are, they really are. He's a good person. I'm sure you've all encountered people who uh, you know something of their story. You know what they're really about. And they're talking to you and they're really portraying themselves as being better than they really are. They'll even start to talk to you about their foreign faith and points of doctrine and politics and various that sort of portraying and giving the impression. But you know the real story. You know it's an act. That's not a good person. A good person has no guile. They are who they are. Uh, Now, a good example for us which also would have been a great text for this sermon, (laughs) but it is, I'm going to talk about it, is Daniel. Daniel was a good man in this sense. Now, what we know about Daniel is that he was basically a political administrator under Babylonian kings and then Persian kings for a long time. He was gifted. Uh, He was very wise. He was extremely devout, and he was a man of unimpeachable character. We see that from the early days, which you'll find in the first three chapters, and then in his latter days, which you'll find in chapter 6. And you all remember what it says in chapter 6, that he was highly esteemed by the Persian king. The Persian king actually loved Daniel, had a great fondness and affection for Daniel, but he had enemies, people who disliked him, envious, jealous of him, wanted his, him, wanted his demise, wanted his position. And they sought all kinds of ways to bring him down. And the first was simply to dig up dirt on the guy. But there was no dirt to dig up. And the text makes an assessment of Daniel saying this, they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. He faithfully served these pagan kings without compromise of his own principles and ethics and religious faith and devotion to God. But what a description here. Neither corrupt nor negligent. They couldn't find anything on Daniel. So you all know what happened. They concocted a thing, they, uh, a little story. They uh, got the king, deceived the king to make a decree based on the law of the, Pes- the, uh, the Medes and the Persians that was invoyable, could not be done away with, nullified, or anything like that. 
But once it was in place, it had to stay in place. And, it, and basically the law, which to us seems kind of silly, but it was a real thing back then. Nobody could pray to a god for a whole month except to the king. The king was a god. Thought to be. So they have deified. But anyway, so he, he went with this. He signed it. And of course, Daniel didn't go for it. He did what he always did. He prayed three times a day to Yahweh. And he did so in a way that so they would see him do it. He knew what was going on. He opened his windows, and they saw him, and they were gleeful. Got him. And you know what happened. He was thrown in the lion's den, even though the king didn't want him to be thrown in the lion's den, and he was delivered. But what we're seeing here, brothers and sisters, is that Daniel was a good man. They could not find guile on this man. He was godly. He feared God. And you know what? When it came time, this wasn't the first for Daniel, nor for the other Hebrews. For the pressure of the world to come upon him, he didn't cave. He stayed good. Sometimes our goodness comes at a cost. Otherwise, we compromise, and there goes goodness. His goodness came at a cost. So we see a man then of integrity. So the picture we're getting now of goodness is it involves generosity in the one hand, a good person who will go well beyond even what righteousness calls us to. And we also see integrity. He was full of integrity. And what the Bible is telling us here is that God the Holy Spirit is working God's goodness into our hearts and lives. And this leads us to really what is the fountain of goodness of our own character. God himself, right? God is good. Over and over. This, is, this acclamation, this extolling of God and his goodness is found repeatedly in the Psalms. Over and over in various places. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Psalm 136. Psalm 119. I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord. Actually, I, I, I misquoted there. Back, I'm going back. You are good, and what you do is good, Psalm 119. Now the other passage, remember Moses had asked God to see his glory. Can I see your glory? And God, God said, yes, I will put you in a cleft in the rock, and I will pass by, and, I will, and you will see my goodness. Isn't that interesting? He asked for glory, and God said, you will see my goodness. The glory of God is goodness. And then he proclaims to uh, Moses, right? The Lord, the Lord, full of compassion, slow to anger, forgiving those who confess and love him, showing judgment and, 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 and discipline to those who disobey. That's all the goodness of God. God is good. That's in Deuteronomy 32. So what we see here, God is generous. It is he who is upright. It is he who is trustworthy. There's no crookedness in God. There's no deceit in God, right? There's no corruption in God. And so we are called to walk in goodness. His goodness reigns upon the just and the unjust. He causes his son and rain to fall upon those who are good and those who are evil. Even when he uses the sins and the evil of men to accomplish purposes, he does so for good of purposes. Good purposes. You are very aware of the Genesis passage where Joseph says to his brothers, you intended it for evil. You, this whole thing of throwing me into slavery and selling me off to the Egyptians and all that's happened. What you intended, you intended it for evil. They were evildoers, his brothers. But God intended it for good. And he goes on. To accomplish what is being done now, the saving of many lives. God even uses the evil that is in men's hearts and in their tensions and in their actions for good. So here's the point. God is good. God is good all the time. God is good every day, all day. Never is he not good in any way whatsoever. And in his goodness... He sends Christ. For when the saving goodness, Paul says, when the goodness of God our Savior appeared, what? The goodness of God our Savior appeared. When did it appear? When Christ came. God in His goodness has sent Christ in the world to overcome sin, have victory over evil. It is goodness that will prevail. Overcome, Paul says, 
evil with what? Good. That's only because God has been doing it by sending Christ into the world to die for our sins, that we might become righteous men and women, that we might begin to know the goodness of God, not just intellectually, but in our very character, in our actions, in our decisions. Let's ask something then about Jesus. What about the goodness of Jesus? Is there any word about that? The answer is yes. Peter one time was preaching, and he was testifying of Christ. He says, Jesus was one who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The entire ministry of Jesus is is sized up right here as a man who went about doing good and healing people who were oppressed by Satan. And and so we see it. Let us remember that our Lord Jesus came into the world with a mission. And the mission was given to him by the Father, and he was absolutely dedicated without any deviation whatsoever from doing that mission. And there were plenty of pressures put upon him to so deviate. We think of Satan in the desert temptations, and in Jerusalem, the three temptations, those were intended to veer him off course. He who was the Messiah, and the Son of Man, and the Son of God. Did he succumb? Not at all. We might think of Peter. Once Jesus made known to them that, his disciples, that he's going to Jerusalem, he'll be delivered over the authorities, and they're going to crucify him, he said, far be it from you. He's trying to veer Jesus away from doing this. Jesus strongly rebukes him, if you recall. His own mothers, or his mother and brothers at one point, said he's outside of his mind. There are numerous times. There are times when the Lord Jesus could have easily deviated. When he's being arrested in the garden, right? His disciples want to do something, want to stop that. One of them pulls the sword, remember that? And Jesus says to what? To one of them. Do you not know that I can call down 12 legions of angels right now? But he didn't do that because he was there to fulfill the Father's will. This is part of the goodness of Christ. He went about doing good. So he healed, right? He cast out demons. He taught people the kingdom of God. Ultimately, he died for them on the cross. He was blasphemed, they said, and slandered. They said that he was a drunkard and a wine bibbered. He associated with outcasts, a friend of sinners. This is all slander, meant to pressure him and others to not following him. All of it was a lie. At one point, they were saying that he uh, blasphemed the temple and even thus blasphemed God. None of it was true. Nobody could steer Jesus away from the course. And all this is bound up in Jesus or Peter saying he was a man who did good. He went about doing good. All these stories we see in the scriptures, yes, they represent the love of Christ. They represent the kindness, action, and compassion of Christ. But they also represent his goodness. In the scriptures, we find uh, basically there's a whole gamut of emotions that are applied to Christ, but there are two that are accentuated uh, in terms of how they depict the emotions of Jesus. One of them is compassion. He saw the crowd and he would have compassion. That's the goodness of Christ. But the other one was indignation and anger. We see this at Lazarus' tomb where he's angry at death. But we also see it when he's in the temple where he's got some, not the temple, uh, 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 on the Sabbath in synagogue. And there's a man there who has a withered hand. And everyone's waiting to see if he's going to heal this man on the Sabbath. And of course he does. But he looks around at them first and it says on his face was anger and indignation. Why was he angry? Because he was a good man. And these people did not want to show compassion, even on the Sabbath. But surely is a day where you can show compassion. He was generous. He was righteous. He was fully uh, and full of integrity, even if it cost him. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was a good man. And so I think we got a good picture here of of goodness in the scriptures. Uh, So what we find then is that Paul tells us the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit is working in us, goodness. One passage that bears this out actually is from the Lord Jesus. He says, for no good tree bears bad fruit, or again, a bad tree does not bear uh, good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. 
Figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. He says, the good person out of the treasure of his heart produces good. That's the spirit working right there. He works in our hearts, producing a treasure that results in us doing good. He says, the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speak. God is working in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God that we read and is preached and is taught, conforming us more to Christ, building us up more in Him so that we produce good fruit that comes from a good heart. It is not the case, brothers and sisters, that as Christians we just sort of remain in our sins. That's not true. The Spirit of Christ works in us to grow us in the work of Christ, or in the image of Christ. We should aspire then to be good people in the best and fullest sense of what that means. Men and women like Daniel, like Barnabas, like Ruth. There's all kinds of examples of this in the Scripture. Ultimately, like our Lord Jesus Christ. We should actually be examples to one another of what a being a good person is. And I want to say to you, this is a church that has a lot of goodness in it. There's a lot of giving. There's a lot of generosity. And there's a lot of integrity that ought to be an example to each and all of us, to the young and even to the old. And I just want to highlight some other passages in Scripture. This is, becomes a big deal, especially in the, in, the, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, but also 1 Peter. But I'll focus on Paul. Paul says this, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Right? They're both in antithesis, evil and good. But notice the emotions, hate, and then cling to what is good. It's a picture of someone really striving to stay away from the one and, of course, go to the other. In this case, good, right? And then we're called to be generous, and Paul says this to the Corinthians. He says, God is able to bless you abundantly that you might abound in, this and this, in every good work. There he's talking about the giving of money in this case. But every good work. God is able to bless us so that we will abound. We are called to, uh, to do good to all men, but especially the household of faith. That's Galatians 6. And then he will also say there in Galatians 6, do not be weary in doing good. Do not be weary. Don't allow yourself to give up. Don't allow yourself. Doing good can be hard. In fact, the elders of the church, one of the qualifications for an elder is that he, along with being disciplined, hospitable, upright, holy, he is to be a lover of what is good. Thus an example. And so he'll say to Titus, in Titus 2.7, he says, Titus, set an example before the brethren by doing what is good. Set an example before the brethren. He says of women in the church, in this case, Older women, he addresses younger men, younger women, older men, older women. But the older women, he says this. He says they are to be uh, reverent, not to be slanderers, addicted to much wine, but teach what is good. And he ends the, the book of Titus with this exhortation. Our people must learn to devote themselves to what is good. God is developing. God is growing us, brothers and sisters, and what is good. Do we, I think we could see now this is not a humdrum, blase attribute of Christian character. It's right at the core, isn't it? This is an essential, foundational character or attribute or aspect of Christian character. Let us strive then to be good in women. Why is this? Well, yes, because God is good, because Christ is good. But as I said earlier, I hinted at it, God in his goodness overcomes evil. God in his goodness sent Christ. And Christ has had victory over sin and death. He has been raised. There's a dynamic there. We are to be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what God is doing. Part of the goodness that we are to have is simply exemplifying and playing out the dynamic that is, in fact, the cross. The cross is God's goodness overcoming the world and is now being displayed in our lives. 
we should be good because the Spirit is working in us so that we will. And it's what God puts before us. So what this means, brothers and sisters, is that you and I need to attend to our character, as I said earlier. It's very important. And here to goodness. And what this means is that we should pay attention to our sense of generosity. Am I the kind of person who everything's just got to be just, it's only do I buy, done what, by what's right? Or will we go beyond it in generosity? These guys in that synagogue on that day were holding to some very strict interpretation. And for them, it was not right. Actually, it was. And so Jesus healed the man. Sometimes we go beyond righteousness. We can, as the book of Ecclesiastes says, be overly righteous. The fact is, is those men still needed to eat. So goodness in terms of generosity. Goodness also in terms of being devoid of guile and evil. People like, men and women like Daniel. Let us aspire, as I said earlier, to the moral excellence that, D, that Daniel exemplified. It says he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Don't let your goodness come off or rather be play acting in any way. Be through and through a good person out in the world. And in the church, think of Barnabas. Glad when he sees the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of other people. Rejoicing exhorting. Let us serve the church, brothers and sisters. That's part of what it means to be a good Christian, to serve the church of Jesus Christ according to our capacities and our gifts. And there's one more incentive for you and I as to why we should strive for goodness. It's found really in many spots in the scripture. I can give a long argument on it, but I'll just quote one verse. Goodness brings God's favor. We're not saved by it. But God still responds to our goodness, our good works, with favor. It pleases him and he rewards. So Proverbs 12, 2 says, A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of evil devices he condemns. Both Dan Daniel and Barnabas are not just mentioned. They're esteemed in Scripture. It is a proper motivation for us to be properly esteemed by both God and men. So let us walk in the Spirit and pursue goodness in our lives. Well, that's God's Word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we bow before the Word of God. It is a light into our pathway. It is the ultimate standard for life and doctrine. And we have been instructed Thank you for this instruction. Help us to continue in Christ as Barnabas uh, exhorted those that day, so us today. And let us follow the example of someone like Daniel. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll bring to the Lord our tithes and offerings at this time.
Let's rise again to sing to our God, hymn 730, about heaven, all the stanzas of 730. Receive the Lord's blessing, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Thank you.